Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Blake. I, you know, started this YouTube channel a long time ago following Hyperloop. Um, I see a lot of uh, the participants um, in the room. Uh, you know, I've, I've talked to personally and met over the years. Um, so thanks for joining uh, in such short notice on a Saturday morning. I'm here in Denver, Colorado. Um, I planned this kind of early to fit Europe and the Middle East and uh, and um, India. So sorry, California, <laughs> but um, yeah. So Hyperloop, I'm just gonna start uh, on the first slide. Um, unfortunately, I can't share my screen, but um, yeah, check out the link in the, in the chat area. If you have any questions, just unmute yourself and interrupt me. Let's go to slide number two. Um, what is COVID? I know you guys have, have all been uh, bombarded over the last couple months about COVID. I thought I would include just a little bit of medical information. Um, and uh, uh, this is basically, um, you know, a respiratory illness. Um, it's highly infectious. You can uh, infect others before uh, they become sick and before you know you're sick. Um, and it can be uh, transmitted to others uh, throughout their illness period and um, as long as that illness period lasts and it's you know weeks long um, so uh, oh yeah thanks and thanks Bill for uh, including that um, I'm gonna skip to slide number three now um, it's it's really uh, the bad part about COVID-19 um, and I especially kind of the transportation industry for person transportation industry is that it's uh, it's just super high risk. Um, you know, it's super easy to uh, get infected, especially with close contact um, within six feet within long periods of time. So especially for people on mass transportation, um, it's difficult to contact trace. You might have heard that lately um, because, you know, there's just so many, um, you know, different exposures. Um, and the only really way to isolate COVID-19 is uh, to isolate and quarantine people. Um, and that's really difficult for many reasons. Um, and contact tracing uh, really relies on things like identifying what flights, um, airplane flights, um, people came on uh, and other things. Um, so in the future for <laughs> Hyperloop, it will be really important to track people that are on on the Hyperloop um, because uh, of the conf confined space. Um, so just the only way to stop COVID-19 is limit contact uh, between people who are infected. And I see there's more people arriving. So hello, everybody. Um, and as, as I've mentioned before, I can't figure out how to share my screen uh, because I have to restart Zoom. So just click the slide deck presentation in the chat on the right. Um, this is kind of, um, uh, it's going to be brief, <laughs> my presentation, um, and then we'll go into, uh, you know, a discussion and then updates. And so then at that time, you all can uh, join in. So right now I'm on uh, slide number four of the slide deck, um, Google Doc. And, um, and is Will in the room? Oh, oh, he's arriving. Sorry. Um, let me admit. admit. Um, so I was, I'm going to leave um, the boring company update uh, maybe a little bit uh, later. Um, Will uh, runs a YouTube channel called The Boring Revolution um, and has been tracking Boring Company, but Tesla has definitely been working on ventilators and Elon has. Um, you know, tweeted a lot about that um, lately. Um, I'm, I'm gonna kind of leave it at that for the, the Tesla because there's a lot of our uh, articles already written about that. Um, and so we're now on slide number five, um, uh, Hyperloop pod competition teams. Um, and uh, I know some of you guys uh, in the room are Hyperloop pod competitions. So you guys will be able to give your updates um, a little bit after, but let me just get through the slide deck. And, um, and also, uh, Will, I'll let you talk a little bit about the Boring Company and their updates from Las Vegas, if that's okay. <laughs> um, 
so there's no hyperlipod competition in 2020. There's been, there's been a lot of controversy. And luckily, um, I think some members from Avishkar Hyperloop kind of pressured Elon Musk to give an update on uh, you know, whether the pod competition would happen. Um, and um, you know, still interested in Hyperloop, but it's just not happening in 2020, luckily, perhaps. Um, most of these comp most of these pod competition teams are working remotely, depending on the country. I know some of the European teams are uh, have a little sometimes less restrictions and are able to work person to person. I know some of the American teams are definitely working remotely. Um, all of these teams come from different countries and faculties of universities, and it really is a global competition. Um, so a crisis like COVID uh, really does uh, put a hamper on. Uh, development uh, for Hyperloop pod competition teams if you think uh, you need to work closely together, you know, um, in, in one room. Um, and for all the new people that just arrived, um, you can look at the Google Doc link and follow. I'm on slide five. Um, Delta Hyperloop has released safety reports. Um, ironically, this doesn't really mention uh, COVID-19 um, and it's still doing testing. Um, Gator Loop is still finalizing design. Tomb Hyperloop is posting some results of their research. Um, Davis Hyperloop and One Loop are still working. Um, Hype Ed uh, released a press release about linear induction motors, their chassis, and their magnetic braking. Um, and Avishkar Hyperloop, uh, you know, got some mention from IIT Madras, their hosting university, about face shields. I know other teams have been. Uh, working really hard on face shields um, and using their 3D printers and that's really good and um, I know Brent uh, in the in the room um, can talk more about working remotely maybe later <laughs> uh, because uh, he has a lot of experience um, with our loop but um, yeah everybody's pretty much remote right now now on to slide six hyperloop one um, they appear to be working remotely we haven't heard any hardware <clears throat> release um, or technical updates. Um, they released with the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission a final report on Midwest Connect and a feasibility study um, which found that hyperloop technology uh, could work along Columbus and Chicago and Pittsburgh. And uh, social media has been kid-friendly um, as you can see in the image on slide six and no progress report in Saudi Arabia. I know there's been setbacks um, in India um, for their um, design of, of pod. And oh, thanks, Dublin Loop. Yep, um, in the chat. And um, yeah, we still don't really know what's going on in Saudi Arabia uh, nor India. Um, they've not really released any information. Um, but Hyperloop One, you know, is uh, also uh, owned partly by Virgin. And I know Virgin Atlantic, the airplane, um, had, you know, Richard Branson has sold shares. And so I wonder if Hyperloop One will perhaps be on uh, kind of the selling block <laughs> if things get really bad. Um, the next slide, slide seven. I don't know if anybody from Hyperloop TT is in, in the room, but um, uh, their test track uh, in France is kind of a mystery. Um, no real updates. They have their pod. Um, that was built in Spain. It was delivered. Um, they released an image uh, showing some assembly and integration, perhaps, and polishing. Um, new management reorganization. I know there's a, there's a couple new faces in the upper management. Um, they also have released the Great Lakes, uh, you know, projects connecting Cleveland, Chicago, and Pittsburgh, um, but no further updates. And maybe you guys know more about um, Hyperlift TT. Um, and updates, but that's kind of all I got. Um, the next slide, slide eight, Heart and Delta Hyperloop. They released um, um, a published study about uh, connecting all the Netherlands, the greater Netherlands region with Germany and Paris. And uh, uh, so yeah, that was a really great study, but then COVID happened. Um, and uh, you know, it, it kind of throws everything into turmoil because the borders have been closed between these countries. And I'm not sure if they actually expected that, especially in their study. Um, and there's no real timeline. I don't think uh, 
for updates on their European Hyperloop Center test facility. Um, and then they tweeted and posted on Instagram this really snarky tweet um, saying weatherproof um, in relation to Launch America and the SpaceX launch that might happen again today, um, but might be canceled due to the weather. Um, so slide nine, uh, Transpod in Canada and also in France and in Italy. Um, they really, I think, were one of the most um, forward Hyperloop uh, companies to um, release you know, information about they're really focusing now on creating respirators and responding to the COVID crisis. And so they got a lot of press, um, rightly so. And uh, their head uh, CEO, Sebastian Garon, um, also you know, tweeted out why um, the company is switching um, and diverting resources from Hyperloop uh, to COVID response and respirators. So that's, uh, it's been a really positive um, story. Uh, we haven't seen any other Hyperloop company really switch this dramatically um, to the response in, hyper in COVID. And then slide 10, Hyper Poland, you know, has been uh, tweeting a lot about their funding and um, how, you know, they're doing another funding rounds and their next, you know, solution to uh, building a larger test track um, for their mag rail solution. Um, however, we've really seen um, across the United States and in Europe, uh, freight rail has dramatically declined. Um, it is super uh, crazy for the industry and the logistical systems in Poland have also changed dramatically. I don't know if this changes the uh, business case for Hyper Poland or makes it better uh, because of the change in demand. Um, but it's, this COVID crisis has really rocked the boat on all infrastructure and, uh, you know, freight uh, transportation and across the continents. So any questions right now? I just want to open it up briefly. And feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, there's, th this is Bill James with J-Pods. And uh, are you familiar with the London Tube study and the MIT studies? Uh, if not, I will post a link yeah. into the chat area. Uh, the London Tube study was done in 2014, and it shows that queuing and transfers amplify contagion spread of the flu about six times. And COVID-19 is more significant than that. The MIT study is of the New York City subways, and it shows how the, all the hot spots of COVID are right around subway stations and that subway workers are three times more likely to be infected than any other people in New York. Mm. So there, it's really clear that, that we have to shift from, from mass transit packet switch transportation networks. Okay. Yeah. Good point. I'll post that link. Cool. Thanks. Any other questions or comments right now? Um, I was going to move... Um, or actually, sorry to put you on the spot, uh, Will. Um, uh, are, do you have any comments about Boring comp Company or have they you know, been affected by the COVID outbreak and construction in Las Vegas? Um, I, I was very, very surprised in Las Vegas. Near enough progress has remained on track. Um, near enough the same number of people on site. Uh, progress has been very, very good. They've actually had a schedule. Um, sheet piling has been going very, very nicely last month. Just started dropping in the trusses for the underground station at station two. Um, just started installing the roadway in station one. Everything seems slightly ahead of schedule, if not well ahead of schedule, which is, is phenomenal. Um, and there seems to be near enough no impact of COVID, which is quite surprising, really. Certainly in the UK, a lot of construction sites have, have closed down entirely for about two months now. So the fact that they've been able to continue in Nevada has been an exceptional uh, achievement, really. And uh, you've got to give credit to uh, Steve Davis and the team. They've been absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. And I've noticed just here in the construction in Colorado that every, every construction worker is wearing a buff. Um, so they are taking the PPE part very seriously, especially on the site. Um, and I haven't looked at the webcams to see the boring company in Las Vegas to see if people are wearing buffs, but... Um, but yeah, they're, they're taking it seriously here in Colorado. Um, Absolutely. Anybody else have any questions or 
comments? Um, so actually, I got this idea from from Will. Um, on slide 11 is a SWOT analysis. I don't know if you guys want to do a group uh, activity of you know of seeing what are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats of Hyperloop development in the COVID era, um, or if you just want to open it up for a group uh, talk. That's that's good too. Hey, Blake, you're in Colorado. Any update on evacuated to transportation technologies from your view? Yeah, so uh, good, good question. I wear two hats. <laughs> so I'm also, uh, I tweet from Colorado Hyperloop um, Twitter account. And, um, you know, uh, the state of Colorado has, uh, or it will have a, a massive economic uh, deficit and um, projects that you know we're going to construct or reconstruct highways, um, even pedestrian projects like uh, bike and bike lanes. Um, the state is find, find, you know, finding a massive economic uh, deficit, um, so now they can't even do those projects. So, um, I mean, my no, my only I'm, I'm talking oh, about sorry. Blake. Yeah. I'm talking about the co the company ET3, the one that's been around since the late '90s. Yeah, I haven't actually. Um, He's in, you should go yeah. investigate in your backyard. Yeah. yeah, they are in my backyard. They're just so north. yeah. I was, I don't know if people yeah. are familiar with ET3, but I got yeah. into this business. I'm pretty sure before everyone, but I started working for them in 2011. Yeah, and then in 2012, I got them a lot of news. And then you know, Elon mentioned Hyperloop the first time in, in July 2012, and then he, a whole year went by, and then he invited ET3 and myself to SpaceX three weeks before he released the Hyperloop Alpha paper. Yeah, and you guys are so, just recently active on Twitter again. Um, yeah, after that's, a long that's, that, that's yeah. me. I don't, oh, okay. I, I've, I've stepped aside in helping directly with, with ET3 at the moment, okay. um, but I know that they just ex extended their patents on their, on their oh, yeah. switching, oh, cool. switching. So, um, but yeah, they're, they're quietly developing things and okay. I'm focused more on, on the regulatory framework. And I think Bill can chime in here on getting us, which is the real barrier to entry is the rights away. Mm. So, um, so I've been focusing on that for everyone really, and which is called the Solar Mobility Act. And uh, Bill, maybe you want to tell them a little bit about the Solar Mobility Act and, and where we think how Hyperloop could, could take advantage of that. And uh, my plans did get derailed. Uh, unfortunately, I would have had it passed in the Arizona legislature, but the legislature uh, disbanded and not going to get it passed till next year. Yeah, uh, the legislatures are definitely affecting uh, progress in Kansas and uh, Missouri um, with a Hyperloop projects connecting some cities there and then Hyperloop one. Um, but yeah. Okay, yeah but so you should definitely, you should go visit Daryl. Love yeah. to hear an update from him. <clears throat> is, go, is, go is it a good time to talk about the regulatory and how to get rights of way to, to start building these? Missouri did, the Missouri House and the Missouri Senate both passed the Hyperloop law. It's pending the governor's sign off, as I understand it. I, I heard it got Christmas treed and got killed off because, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I don't know which bill is which and which state, but. Um, but yeah, the, definitely uh, all of the state legislatures uh, across the U.S. Um, have basically, yeah, uh, halted work um, and are now, um, you know, trying to scramble <laughs> to find a budget. Uh, and uh, this will severely impact transportation development, at least through public funding. Well, I've, I've got two, I've got three states that are likely to have action in the next three weeks. Uh, on this thing. Uh, and we received a letter of intent from Baja, California, from the state of Baja, California last week. And J I'm with JPods, not a Hyperloop. I'm, if you think about the, the high speed, the internet, the physical internet will have three layers similar to the internet where you have fiber optics will be the Hyperloops, JPods will be the Wi-Fi, we're local area networks, and then self-driving cars will be the Bluetooth. 
Um, but Georgia, Arizona, and or Georgia, West Virginia, and uh, Arizona, we've got three meetings next week uh, on this. But I'm going to post a link to the law that's pending in Massachusetts, and it's uh, just been picked back up and is being worked on. Um, and it's the five by five standard. Basically, it lays out that if you're five times more efficient than existing modes, then they have to write a rejection instead of an acceptance. And then we pay 5% of gross revenues for non-exclusive use of rights of way. With that, we could be building hyperloops as soon as technology is available. And this is what we negotiated and got signed off in China. And so we've got a contract in China under this. If anybody's interested in this framework, let me know. Yeah, I mean, if, if we could take a vote, who, I'm so curious, how many people do we have right now, Blake, on this? Yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, I just kind of want to keep this focused on Hyperloop and COVID real quick. But um, do we have any other international folks that want to discuss um, how COVID has affected their work? Or anybody? Because I know um, a lot of international folks were quite relieved uh, with the Hyperloop Pod competition uh, being uh, delayed <laughs> because of the crisis. Um, but I was just wondering if anybody else had any ideas. Can I chime in? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Carl McCare from Dublin in Ireland. Um, one of the things that COVID has brought about is the um, working from home. Mm -hmm. and conference calling which will render transport <laughs> a little bit obsolete so yeah. um, I, I honestly see Hyperloop as a replacement for jet transport mm -hmm. and but the, the main benefit to that is the environment um, one of the campaigns I'm working on at the moment is to ban empty planes flying around um, in Irish airspace so pretty much a lot of the North American air, air traffic goes through Irish airspace and uh, yeah. the Green Party in Ireland is about to form a new government and one of the proposals will be for a complete ban on flights with less than 95% capacity flying in Irish airspace. Yeah that's I mean, it, yeah, I mean, in Colorado, there's one, you know, regional jet that's flying 30 miles just because they got funding through the COVID yeah, crisis. And how many yeah, passengers are on board, maybe two or three passengers on board. Yeah, yep. So you're, you're, you're looking at each person costing five to $10,000 for a yeah. flight. So I've been, I've been thinking I've, about I've yeah. tracking a, a flight radar there and we had mm -hmm. three planes going to Chicago with an, uh, a capacity of over a thousand passengers and probably about 50 passengers on all three planes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've been thinking about just kind of how the airplane industry will will uh, have to change Employed. drastically. Yeah. yeah. Um, and unfortunately well, here I mean, in the United States, we don't have an, another option really. Amtrak is not ready to no. get the airplane industry uh, <laughs> you know, people uh, to use their system, so. Um. Just back to the um, uh, land use. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Ireland had a, pro uh, Dublin had a project there, an urban tunnel mm -hmm. um, going underground in Dublin. And w one of the issues that came up time and time again was compensation demands from house households with the tunnel going underneath. Mm -hmm. So what the government of the day uh, did was actually nationalize land. So all land under 100 feet of your property now belongs to the government, hmm. which means any infrastructure projects such as Metro would um, not uh, require compensation. I know um, some states in America do have that uh, law in place. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I do know, um, <laughs> potentially, uh, don't mean to throw back to you, Will, but um, being in the UK, you've heard uh, you know a lot of discussion about HS2. Um, has COVID crisis really affected HS2 being built in the UK? Um, 
it had a lot of problems. <laughs> yeah, well, there's been a few things going on at the moment that a lot of people are, are quite upset about, like the um, oh. quite a lot of forests in and around HS2, mm. where the line runs, and they've actually been cutting down the forests whilst this COVID crisis has been gone ongoing, mm. which has been totally unnecessary. Um, we've had people in trees who've basically been starved of water and food uh, until they left the area, which has been very disappointing. Um, I understand, obviously, there's, there's two sides to every story, but uh, that sort of thing is, is unacceptable, especially with all this uh, yeah. COVID illness going on. But, uh, I mean, HS2 is, is turning into an absolutely immense disaster. I, I seem to spend most of my day debating people on Twitter, yep. trying to inform them that maybe we need to look at the cost of this thing. Um, as much as I, I, you know, I have been supporting HS2 for maybe you know 10 years, but the costs have blown up so much now that... Uh, it's uh, it's getting to the stage where I'm potentially thinking about probably opposing this whole thing because uh, <laughs> every year it seems to go up by about 15, 20 percent. I mean, I don't understand how people are estimating the, the project and then they're just adding adding it. It's uh, if I was going to be honest, very honest with you, I think it's consultants getting their hands on the, uh, the project and deliberately underbidding in order to win the contract mm -hmm. and then adding various aspects to the job and uh, we could we could do this for half the, the amount and double the speed if we opted for a Hyperloop system or even just a traditional pods in a tunnel boring company system. Um, so it's, you, uh, you, it's a tricky one. You bring up a good point. Um, just last week there was an article about um, high-speed rail in California. Um, due to the COVID crisis they're canceling a lot of the um, consultant contracts <laughs> and they're saving hundreds of millions of dollars and this is kind of the same argument that's levied against Hyperloop uh, feasibility studies. You know, the local government, you know, puts up a lot of money for these feasibility studies. And um, a lot of that money goes to third party companies and contractors that are doing the studies. And, you know, mm. the local population is like, why didn't you just build a new bike lane <laughs> for that <laughs> contract <laughs> dollar amount? And so yeah, it's, I, I don't have a good answer to that, but um, these are definitely expensive. The whole uh, land discussion is a very interesting one, certainly in the UK. Um, so HS2 has been going around acquiring land mm -hmm. uh, and they've been purchasing that land. Uh, and a lot of these people that own that land didn't want to sell that land. And the prices they've been getting have been absolutely atrocious. And mm -hmm. uh, quite a lot of the time, they've actually not been paid and then had the land uh, forcefully taken from them. So uh, mm. it's, not, it's not an ideal situation if you've mm. got no land and then you've got no money for a good few years. So uh, there's got to be a better way of doing it. We've, we've got to look at how we can move more of that underground, how mm -hmm. we can uh, maybe site uh, stations outside major cities rather than putting them in the middle of a city and all the, uh, the costs and the uh, uh, confusion and all the uh, disruption that causes. Um, that we, we've got to look at things in a, a totally different way than we are at the moment. Because these these consultants they um, they're not interested in whether a project succeeds. To them, uh, quite a lot of the time, it's how much can they milk from the job, and that's an unfortunate reality with a lot of consultants. Now, I'm not saying all consultants are bad, but um, certain groups of consultants in the UK in the rail industry, it's um, it's not the most ethical mm -hmm. way of operating. Yeah. Um yeah, I think you bring up a good point. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on is is the Hyperloop nascent Hyperloop and other you know pod companies are we agile enough um, to survive this crisis? Are are we agile enough to you know, or are we just so as an infrastructure kind of company and transportation industry like are we able to survive and you know get around you know high consultancy fees or you know, populations that don't want to have to pay for large infrastructure projects. Anybody have any thoughts? Yeah, I think um, Elon Musk has been very successful in Las Vegas. I mean, if that was a, a traditional um, uh, subway system, could you hmm. imagine what the cost would be? He's yeah, doing it for less than. I, I really, I really recommend that you guys look at the the Solar Mobility Act because it has a really simple framework that says. Everything has, all construction has to be privately funded. And the minute that happens, all of this milking of government contracts goes away because the cost to build the infrastructure falls on 
the the contractors who wish to build. Yeah, and and it just cleans up all of the. Uh, right now, all these decisions are being made on who has political influence, not on efficiency or efficacy to the market. I mean, yeah. we, uh, something sorry. to add to that: that uh, we 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 have a, a system called public-private partnership here in in Ireland, um, uh, where a company uh, agrees to make an infrastructure project. So we had one tunnel. Uh, besides Shannon Airport, and they they made a, a contract with government that would they would make so much in tolls every year, but the traffic never materialized. So that company is now suing the government because they're not making enough money. Well, the, so the, public, you, you go, public if, private if, partnerships don't work either. Well, you, but don't do it as a public private partnership. Make it make put the full burden on the private industry to understand the market and answer a market need. And if they build yeah. something that's not, that's what Musk is doing is he's privately funding these, his own guideways is you make it privately funded. If you lose, if you're stupid and you lose your money, live with it. It's an investment. Right. I just want to interrupt some, Samarth, you're on the call. Um, you're, you're working really hard uh, to foster kind of these startups um, that potentially will try to self-fund to build systems. <laughs> um, do you have any, um, any thoughts or, or give us any updates? Yeah, for sure. Hey guys, thanks for having like such an amazing like start to this conversation. It's so amazing to see people from all over uh, working on all sorts of interesting projects coming together on this call. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the biggest problem though, Blake, is that even though like these startups are, yeah, you can maybe get them to series a or like get them some starting funds and then they can like be privately funded in, uh, from until that point, but they're still dependent on, um, either government money to really build out like large projects or they have to like do some, find some other way to raise that money or, get community buy-in in in order to like build those projects um Mm. so it's still very much dependent on on uh doing that i think the 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 thing that we like we were very focused on um in in davis and in sacramento um when we were when we're working on uh building startups in this region was uh we were focused on trying to um get the government here to work on the seed funds and whatnot to like build out the technology from a, from a much smaller um, perspective. So instead of investing like um, many millions of dollars uh, for a a full project, um, instead of investing hundreds of thousands into like seed funds, more specifically focused on this new technology development um, for both high speed rail development and for hyperloop development, really just on tra- transform transportation infrastructure. And mm-hmm. that's kind of what they started to do in Sacramento with like the civic hacker labs and whatnot. Um, and I think that this has definitely happened and materialized across cities um, in, in North America as well as in Europe. But again, it's just the start. Um, so I, I really like what love to hear what um, everybody else has to think as to like uh, if the, um, crowdfunding model is uh, something that can be sustainable for for like large scale infrastructure development, um, or it needs to be like done in tandem with with uh, grant funding. Or what what kind of is the model moving forward um, to combine some of these best elements? Because I think that's something that's made Hyperloop really amazing is the fact that it's um, had this kind of crowdfunding effect from day one, if you look at Hyperloop transportation technologies or um, even our loop. Yeah, I, um, I, and I wanna just point out, you know, even if you have a government backer, like in India, uh, you know, a regional government um, that was really pro, you know, this corridor between Mumbai and Pune, um, and then all of a sudden the government changes uh, and then the regional government wasn't as thrilled um, um, to build a, a test track even. Um, you know, it just really throws a wrench in everything. Um, and I, you know, we've seen also another company, Arivo, uh, Arivo um, 
was going to build a test track here in Colorado um, near um, E470, which is a toll, private tollway, built through a public-private partnership, by the way, and it's operated by a separate organization. Um, and, but unfortunately, the company went bankrupt <laughs> or just, just stopped. Um, and surprise, um, surprise. Oh, go ahead. Surprise, surprise. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, and I don't know if Brent wants to talk more about this. Sorry, Brent. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah. Um, talk, talk about what, Blake? Uh, actually, um, so Brent uh, has helped organize our loop for many, many years, the Reddit Hyperloop group. Um, and it has been a huge proponent on Twitter lately of working remotely. And um, do you have any thoughts, Brent, on on just how this COVID crisis, or you know, even um, working remotely on you know technology platforms, uh, could happen in the next couple of years or so? Um, yeah, I could share some some general thoughts. So, I mean, our loop started as, as, as a Hyperloop company, uh, or, or I should say a Hyperloop competition uh, team um, during the Hyperloop one and, and two days, but we, we quickly evolved into more of a, a crowdsourced um, engineering platform. Um, some of our work still continues on the Hyperloop, but we did scoop up the Arivo IP once that went um, under, and we've been continuing the work there um, that we see uh, of potential value and, and of interest to ourselves, both in the context of the Hyperloop and um, other projects. Um, since the end of February, um, beginning of March, we had shifted a lot of our efforts towards endeavors that were um, focused on mitigating the, the spread of this pandemic. Mm. Um, in, in whatever ways that we could. And we saw a lot of people working on ventilators and respirators. Um, and we understood the, um, you know, the, the, the very, I mean, there's a very good reason that there's, there's a lot of regulations around these devices. And, and rather than wanting to wade it into there, as everybody seemed to uh, want to do, we, we started focusing on different things. So we've been working with different governments on contact tracing apps. Um, or, or similar, uh, okay. you know, ways, ways to incentivize people to, um, uh, to participate in these contact tracing um, uh, systems. Um, obviously, we've been working for five years now on complex projects, um, with multidisciplinary um, uh, participants. Um, and so we thought we would try and share and spread the lessons learned um, as everybody now finds themselves in these kinds of uh, work scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, a lot of our efforts have been diverted towards uh, pandemic related. Um, we had been working on, as well on establishing a kind of distributed uh, rapid prototyping network. Mm -hmm. And virtually all of that capacity had been devoted towards face shields, um, ear savers. Um, only now is it actually starting to wind down because um, we're, we're, we're from, from the people that we were providing to the, the um, healthcare networks, we're starting mm -hmm. to hear that um, they're, they're comfortable with their stock levels. So um, yeah, so it's a, it's, it's a very interesting time um, I, I do think there's a lot of opportunity in the transportation space as people are starting to um, realize the, the very car-centric nature of, that transportation has taken over the past number of decades. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, new concepts um, that show, you know, possibilities beyond just Cars and autonomous vehicles, which I'm not sold on the benefits of those entirely. Um, it's it's a it's a great time, I think, to be an innovator, and especially in in the kind of transportation and urban planning space. Um, so I, I'm actually really excited to see what comes out of this um, in, in this area. I I think you really bring up. 
a good wild point. Tangent. No, no, no. Um, and I, yeah, I didn't want this to be a really depressing <laughs> topic, um, but I think you bring up a really good point in that, you know, we do have uh, the tools to contribute in a in a good way uh, to society, um, and it's it is a good time to rethink uh, how we live life, uh, whether it's taking the car, you know, six blocks away, and when you could have just ridden a bicycle. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, yeah, your team uh, has been working really hard over these last couple of years. And I'm just going to admit one more person to this meeting. But um, anybody else have any thoughts? Or yeah, wanna share? so I wanted to talk about, uh, now that we are talking about funding and infrastructure, mm -hmm. I wanted to discuss about uh, the topic of offshore infrastructure. So in the end, Hyperloop could be good to connect the continents. For example, we in SCM Loop International want to connect Africa and Europe. So I just wanted to know what thoughts do you have? Because I know there are some projects that have been done for trains and so on. For example, the English Channel or the Orison Bridge. So what are the thoughts on Hyperloop? Thanks, Alberto. And, are you, and you're located in Morocco? Yeah, the company, yeah. its headquarters oh, are in Morocco, but uh, we are expanding to Spain too now. Oh, perfect. Well, uh, thanks for joining um, and thanks for your, <laughs> for direct tweeting me <laughs> and, and <laughs> urging me to do this. Um, uh, yeah, I, that's a great question. Um, you know, I just thinking of uh, the news in the last couple of days, how Norway and Denmark are opening up a tourism zone and they're 100% excluding Sweden <laughs> because of <laughs> the different methods of, uh, you know, response to COVID. Um, and that's kind of, it's a little awkward turtle for the Nordics to not want to invite one of their friends. Um, but, you know, I, I think the board, the tightening of the borders has just been really remarkable. Um, and now we're seeing Germany want to kind of bring Europe out of the COVID crisis um, through different economic uh, schemes. Um, but you bring up a good point. I, I don't know, does anybody else have any thoughts? I mean, I think there's definitely a good economic case for moving um, freight and people between Africa and Europe. And I think that, that kind of project certainly could be justified. Um, I mean, I, I, I've talked about in the past linking Ireland and the UK or Ireland and Scotland. Um, and I think there's definitely other schemes out there as well. Now there's been talks about linking uh, Russia and the Alaska. So if you could justify that economically in terms of how much you're going to bring in, then definitely it is uh, worth considering. Sure, yeah, I wanted yeah, to talk about it because yeah, I've seen in the engineering world some projects of this, but I've never seen a company mentioning it and in the end, from our point of view, Hyperloop is to connect the whole world. So in the end, yeah, matter needs to be addressed. And I don't know if any of you have heard of it, of any company or something. Are you talking about submersible tunnels or versus boring underneath the sea floor? Yeah, there, there are uh, different solutions that uh, have been carried. For example, there's a, between Denmark and Sweden, there's a mixed bridge which is at the beginning, it's uh, on the water and then it goes underwater. I also know there's uh, been, there's doing a project in Norway that they are thinking about different different options like suspension bridge or uh, submersible floating structures. So I've been seeing about the different projects about this, but uh, no one about Hyperloop. So I don't know your knowledge about it. I, I did an interview with a, um, the main research organization for Norway, and they were interested in Hyperloop uh, connecting northern Norway, um, either bringing salmon <laughs> uh, from the fjords of northern Norway to Oslo. And, um, and they were, I think, looking in the small diameter tubes. So these are much smaller than the boring company tunnels. And I was just, um, there's a company out of the UK called Magway that really is just like a, you know, a box 
<laughs> and then whatever you can fit in the box, it's going to go ride, you know, magnetic levi levitation through these small diameter tubes. And it's super cheap uh, to build these tubes. Um, and, you know, they want to connect regional Amazon fulfillment centers or something. <laughs> um, and I, I don't know, I don't see a lot of um, interest in these small diameter tubes to start with for just cargo purposes. But I think it's a really logical step. Um, and, you know, Hyperlip will start with cargo first, uh, um, and then it will get certified for people. So anybody else have any thoughts? What diameters are you talking about, sorry? I think it's like three, you know, one meter, three feet, okay. or a little bit larger than that. So pretty narrow. And it's all, and there's a lot of German, you know, tunneling companies that do this all the time for, you know, high, high voltage power lines or sewer or water. Um, and it's just totally automated. You only need like two people at the job site <laughs> to build these, long, these tubes. Sounds uh, good, sounds interesting. Alberto, you might want to look into ET3 for this use because ET3 is a smaller diameter tube. It's 1.5 meters and it has a much higher capacity than all the other hyperloops you're talking about and it's cheaper. Yeah, uh, I will check it out for sure. ET3.com. And Cormac says hypersciences.com. Um, any, anybody else? Uh, in Hypersciences, just to explain that one, is a, an, another new tunneling company that uh, proposes to use um, rail guns um, to make tunnels, and we, again, we did some work. We did some work with them. Yeah. They can do uh, they can do much larger diameter as well. Um, as well, yeah. I, I visited their um, test tunnels in New Mexico and in um, Idaho, I believe it was. Cool. That is. And how amazing. how are they progressing? Uh, last night I checked in with them fairly well. Um, it's its primary benefit is increasing the speed, um, the speed of penetration, um, and they use a, a type of um, um, I forget what they called it now. It's not. It's, it's, yeah, it's a type of projectile that that yeah. disintegrates in a very controlled way, um, and, and they have a proprietary system to launch these at high speed and high frequency um, to penetrate through. Obviously, the, the, the type of um, material that you're tunneling through is, is very rough. Yeah, yeah, it's got the denser, the better uh, for their system, which is usually the, the higher difficulty for traditional uh, tunnel boring machines. They, they want to do a mile a week. Yeah which would be phenomenal. That would be very impressive. Yeah. Very impressive. So it's, 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 it's a unique technology, all right, but it, 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 no much more information is available at the moment. There's a, a variety of different applications that they're exploring for. I'm just very worried the US military is just going to take them over. Oh, or Elon Musk. No, he showed no interest. I've asked him. In the hyper sciences, really? You asked him? Yeah. Mm. No. When, did you, when did you ask him? Um, I've had some <laughs> uh, interesting chats with the uh, boring company. On the Twitter? <laughs> I, yeah. I, I've been begging them to come to Dublin. Um, our government is proposing to spend five billion on a a five kilometer subway so yeah, it'd be and, better uh, just to have 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 the teslas in the tubes i mean that's that's exactly, the boring company yeah. right yeah but um our government just doesn't know how to spend money they burn it we have a, a national right. children's hospital that's gone from 200 million to 2 billion i mean what government doesn't yeah. i mean yeah. is the pro is the problem government <laughs> I mean, well, it's back to your consultants and your public-private partnerships. They're all in bed with one another, though, and they're all 
X. No, I know because then they they I, in California I had to fight, trying to fight the high speed rail. I was the, one of the first to say it's insane. Here's this other option, but you know these politicians they say oh this is amazing and they turn around and they go vote for the train, and then the money goes to the consultant agency and they they then do the maximum contribution to the politician from the money that was given them out of the government contract. So it's like this this circle of corruption and of doing you know not much innovation government's not really good at innovating anything i mean they the only th hyper risk averse mm -hmm. yes no one wants to stick their political careers on a massive infrastructure project that has no uh no no uh no precedent right mm. well yeah also they don't want to even let a private company like jpods build I mean, we, we proposed like an L LAX, uh, Los Angeles International Airport. We proposed, you know, solar powered pod car networks that would have been privately funded, would have taken people from the, uh, the terminal to the car rental to the hotels. It all would have been privately funded. Instead, they said no, they pretended we didn't exist. And they went and got put a $2 billion people mover in there. And it's going to mm -hmm. take years to build. And it's, it's going to have, it's not going to do anything. It just moves from one central location to to uh, the terminal, just like a couple miles away, and it doesn't solve the hotel and the car rentals and all that stuff. So they don't, they're not really, look, they're protecting their their golden goose. This is the transit agencies just wanna protect the, the money coming in from usually the federal government for these projects, which is again, our taxpayer money, and they don't, it doesn't seem to be like real money to them. I agree. I, yeah, I agree with what you're saying. Global issue. Sorry, go ahead, Cormac. Cormac go ahead. It, it, it's very much a global issue. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's not unique to any particular state. It, uh, it, it seems to be in the construction industry. And I, I am hoping Which, one of the positives that come out, out of COVID is that we are more sensible with our money and we do go yeah. for the, the more advanced option. Well, there's certain code words to look for, and this is Agenda 21 stuff, but it's transit-oriented development. Anytime you hear that, you can get, you, you know why every country is the same, because it is a worldwide plan for us to put people, put, basically put people in shoebox apartments next to light rail lines. Yeah. I think and the transport. Part, part, part of the big problem is it's very easy for them to um, you know, hand wave us away by saying that it's just a theoretical um, um, technology. If we we have to make it so compelling and and real that it's very very difficult for them to dismiss it on on any means beyond um, um, financial. That, that's that's one of the things that's really really key is. Look at the metrics. There, right now, all these decisions are being based on political influence, not energy consumed per unit of economic work. So mm -hmm. there's metrics like energy per passenger mile, and I'll send you some links on metrics. But, and that's what makes the Solar Mobility Act so important, is it shifts it from political influence deciding what's going to be built to that if it's not five times more efficient, it can't get funded. And if it can't be funded by private contractors on their own risk of their own innovations, then it shouldn't be built. I think we've, we've seen a lot of uh, development and European hyperloop companies working together to create um, kind of standardizations um, with Hart Hyperloop kind of leading the pack. Um, I also know, you know, you have you know, 60 year old plans from Switzerland and creating, you know, a regional subway system that are now just kind of coming back with uh, a hyperloop company called SwissPod. Um, and, you know, they're saying we're the green tech alternative to Switzerland's transportation. Um, you know, and I don't know, it's, it's hard. Well, to I say. also know that Hyperloop One, which has the most money, is got their lobbyists going and they're playing the high-speed rail game. I mean, really, is it any much better than high-speed rail? They're trying to get the Federal Railroad Administration to be the regulator. That's a big mistake. 
I mean, we really got to look at the 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 F24, the ASTM, that's in the Solar Mobility Act. But the same thing that Disneyland uses, we should be able to use. Let's not beg government to regulate us. Let's just go and do what's already been doing in private companies and, and, and is proven much safer than roads. And do you think the COVID crisis will help um, kind of expand or bring to light yeah, this kind of argument? Yeah, it, yeah, it, yes, it, 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 it has it, with absolutely J-Fun. breaking it. It's, uh, yeah, I, will, I will also post you a link to the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment Study, PB-244854, that was published back in 1975, that identified automated guideways as the solution for, for the 1973 oil embargo and foreign oil addiction. And it lays out that federal regulations have blocked innovation for four to six decades. So this is a congressional document that we could use to put in front of regulators and say, you're not risk averse in challenging Hyperloop and J-Pod kind of technologies. You just wanna fail in the same way you already know how to fail. Yeah, the good thing about the COVID is that it makes people scared to ride the subway. It makes them scared of, of public transport. People are, going into their own cars. So you think, okay, well, what's the, how could this help Hyperloop? Well, well it, people will be in pods. People will yeah. be in pods that are above the street. The pods can, the pods can go into the Hyperloops and, and we, no one ever has to leave their comfy space. People love car size vehicles and yeah, th- th- right people now, like I'm, personal transportation. And, right now, and it's the most sanitary way to do it as well. Yeah, they're talking about car, uh, car, uh, 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 acropolis in in New York, apocalypse. Uh, the number of cars that are going to be driving into New York City is just going to be phenomenal. So yes, it, the COVID crisis has put a shock. Ridership on mass transit in Atlanta is down ninety six percent, despite the fact that they made it free. And same People here in Colorado. That it is a disease. Oh. Con- Cajun spreader. Um, they, they've literally in the UK, they've uh, blocked off seats on trains so that you have to seat two in front of one another. So the trains are nowhere near as full as they used to be, even if people wanted to use them and no one wants to use them. And they never made any money in the first place. So they're never going to make any money now unless things change. And I don't think that's going to happen in the short to medium term. I just want to do a quick uh, time check. I schedule this meeting to 9 15 so we have 15 more minutes and then i think it turns off i have no idea but does anybody else want to uh, that hasn't talked want to share anything or just you know how are you doing have you been staying safe that kind of thing or um hi this is tara um i'm also with jpods but one of the things that keeps kind of coming into my head is the fact that with covid Um, and the ability for what's in existence for mass transportation and the possibility for it to be sanitized and cleaned and all that clearly is failing. So while we have this break per se where everything is being halted and uh, maybe even discontinued or slammed, being able to start our thoughts on jumping ahead of what's already there double timed in the sense of how are we going to cease the contagions within our products and reduce the, the spread of any virus. We shouldn't just pe- you know, be planning in reverse. We should be looking ahead because who knows when the next COVID comes, right? But let's be, you know, let's start playing with technology and, and addressing that question now because the governments and everything that's in place isn't. So that's just a thought. Very Can good I point. join in there? Can I join in there? Uh, one of the things that's being looked at, which is uh, being successful, is a new type of uh, UVC. Um, it's called uh, 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 Triple Two, um, which is a. And I'll put a link there in the chat box. It's a new type of U, uh, UVC that's safe to use on uh, the human skin and eyesight, uh, non-damaging. So all the pods could be fitted with this special type of UVC. Um, there's other things as well that um, the Hong Kong subway has done with BBC spray mist 
but these could all be incorporated into the pods. Um, and it's something I've looked at even before the COVID crisis. Um, I, I was quite concerned because a number of studies has been done and back to um, what somebody was saying about the flu, the seasonal flu, public transport kills. And it's one of the reasons people do not want to use public transport. So it, it is a major hurdle in getting people to use public transit is hygiene and safety. So these, these are new, new technology and new systems that have to be incorporated into, like Tesla is leading the way with the, the help of it, filters incorporated into the car. And they were highly successful in the California forest fires. I mean, and, and pollution kills. Like diesel gate alone killed 15,000 people in Europe. So, I mean, it's, it's something we really have to think about. One of the great advantages of the Boeing company and uh, Hyperloop various companies is that they can start from scratch. Unlike yeah. the, the UK train companies, we're dealing with trains that are 27, 30 years old and still think they can get another five years out of them. You can't retrofit these things in 30 year old trains. You have to start from scratch and build something that's fit for purpose. Until that happens, we possibly might have another outbreak like this in the future. Even existing you know, flus are dangerous. And the world can't afford to do this again. I mean, if every time, was it a million deaths worldwide for COVID now? Is that, is that where we're at? A million? But yeah. we're, you know, we're, we're, we're 8.7, we're like over 8 billion people. If we shut down the economy again, I mean, we can't, we just can't afford to do this. Has, has anybody um, heard any, uh, if high speed rail in China has been affected um, or has it? They has cut it, it off been, straight away. They cut it off, but did it come yeah. back really popular? I mean, it's kind of the only mode to get around China sometimes, but. The, the car sales in Wuhan are way up hmm. and um, I can post the article on it. But okay. yeah, mass transit of every type from high speed rail to airplanes to uh, subways is, and buses are all going to be hit extraordinarily hard by this. And what it's going to do is it's going to hit the least economically capable people. And then, so like in New York City, s s specific circumstances, you shove people together, you got them infected. Those were low income people who were working in nursing homes. They went in there and then people died like flies. So it's, it's, we fundamentally have to look at how we engineer our systems and put it into metrics based standards instead of political influence. Well said. I like that. I like that, Bill. Speaking about um, engineering uh, for these solutions, um, I just was wondering in these like last few minutes if um, any of you guys had any good tips on um, simulation technologies and uh, how relevant they've become and what are some techniques you guys are using towards um, developing your engineering projects uh, remotely. Um, beyond just, you know, the solid works and whatnot, but actually like doing a lot more of the thermal analysis or that kind of work from home, um, rather than doing it like in the lab or, or um, at university campuses and whatnot. Well, if nobody else is going to talk, I'll send you a link and you can download simulation software for JPods and 3D software where you can render them into Google Earth so that you guys can see how these will be feeder networks to hyperloops. Uh, the same thing could be applied to the hyperloops, but because the networks are so expansive, I'm not sure that it's directly applicable. Smart, you bring up a good point. I haven't, um, I haven't seen a lot of tweets from hyperloop teams about this, um, but that's, that's a, I mean, I wonder how they're working. Yeah, I have no idea. I guess I'll jump in here uh, as someone who's part of a Hyperloop team. Um, uh, you know, we are, you know, as a university team on top of any regulations and uh, policy that comes from state and local governments, uh, a lot of the universities have policies on top of that. Um, so we're at CU Boulder uh, and, you know, they're going to have, I think they've released their plan for the fall 
uh, and you know there is going to be a portion of that that's going to be completely remote um, and they're banning a lot of um, student group meetings uh, large scale events um, so there's a lot of remote work that's going to be happening uh, and i think this is actually a place where industry could start working closer with universities um, you know at least our team we're really looking for projects that we can work on um, that can build the students skill sets um, and we have access to the higher level simulation tools um, you know from university licenses that that we're able to use and so um, you know I think that this could be a, a spot where we could really contribute a lot for very cheap. Thank you, Cole. Um, and thanks for responding to me on Twitter um, from, from CU Boulder. That's a very good point. Um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard a need, you know, from these Hyperloop pod competition teams about this. Um, and this is where I thought, you know, maybe the Hyperloop, you know, Elon Musk could kind of do a virtual pod competition, like, come on, <laughs> to help out all these Hyperloop pod competition teams. Um, Anybody have any thoughts about that? <laughs> yeah, I guess following on without the without the competition, um, you know, there's not a specific project that I think a lot of university teams are are working on, and so we're looking for different projects. There's been a lot of um, teams that are trying to start their own competitions, uh, hosting conferences and whatnot. Um, but yeah, if there was if there was an opportunity to get involved to help start working on. Uh, you know, some engineering projects, I'm sure there would be university teams all over jumping at that. Well, let's, let's, if, if we could, I would love to give you guys tools and then you start building the feeder rails that are going to go into how Hyperloops will, will connect them as the Hyperloops start to be developed and deployed. Because you create the feeder rails like J-Pods, then that creates the, uh, the, the demand for the Hyperloop because the pods, you know, you can connect it all together. A question. Um, we have four more minutes. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, uh, funding. Do these um, pod competition teams need funding from, you know, these companies, or is it simply just a matter of, oh, we'll just do the work for free? <laughs> I don't know. Any thoughts? At least from uh, my team side, uh, you know, there's definitely opportunities that we would be happy to, you know, work. Uh, for little to no funding um, but you know if there's any sort of deliverables um, it it gets difficult to fund uh, ourselves uh, there's only so many resources available at the university uh, and now you know with all the covid stuff the those funding opportunities are diminishing quickly so um, you know generally i think funding is Im important for teams but i think that you know, I had some conversations with some other people about doing university sponsored projects uh, and industry sponsored projects with universities. And, um, you know, it really doesn't take that much funding uh, to do that. I think students can work really cheap. Um, you know, if you look at, I guess, a lot of universities have the uh, capstone project, senior project sort of thing. And those, you know, those can be full, full on industry projects uh, that costs, you know, in the four, four figure range. Um, so f fairly, fairly low investment for what you can get out of it. And I just want to, Smarth, can you just um, read aloud what you just posted? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I know that like a lot of teams right now are coming up with competitions. Uh, and I know that like Avishkar Hyperloop is, is trying to put one together. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that like there are plenty of other really cool things happening, but I've been working pretty closely with uh, with Blake and a few others from uh, Hyperloop at UC Davis on putting together a, uh, a Hyperloop research symposium this summer, kind of just focused on like, um, uh, at least like helping some of these, uh, these uh, innovations from like university teams and from uh, um, other startups that are looking to kind of just like write more papers around their work, kind of get the, ju uh, the, the judgment and like the, um, the uh, feedback they need to kind of continue work on that as well as to get them in contact with companies doing similar work. Um, I know it's not the same as for the pod competition at all, but just something to like trying to get the community together and, and focus on that, on that innovation so we can be five times better um, as Bill James was saying. 
So if you're interested, um, I put the link below uh, in the chat if you want to check it out. And if you have any questions, let me know. Anybody else in the last minute or so? I, maybe the meeting will continue onward <laughs> after 15, but anybody else? Thank you all for joining. Um, this has been really helpful for me. What, Blake, I don't know if you can, I don't know if all these links disappear at the end of the meeting, but maybe you could copy that into a document yep. and then um, put it into a Google Doc and then send out that link or something. Um, yeah. I'm just going to add it as a, the last um, slide to the slide deck. Yep. Done. Ooh, I'll fix the formatting later, but yeah. No problem. Um, and this slide deck uh, will be open. I'm not going to change the editing rights, but <laughs> uh, it'll be open. Okay, cool. I had, cool. I had, sorry, I just had like one other question um, with regards to like the engineering stuff. Um, I remember Brent had said something about rapid prototyping sites. Um, could you go into a little bit more depth on that? That sounded really interesting. Sure. Well, we were born as a remote team. And when we built our first couple um, prototypes for the Hyperloop competition, we did it in a somewhat, um, I think, unique way, wherein a, a variety of uh, team members were building the components um, separately all over, um, all over the globe, depending on the availability of, of equipment um, and tooling to them. And, and then it was all brought together and integrated and tested in proximity to um, um, SpaceX's headquarters in Hawthorne, California. And we thought we would try to kind of um, formalize this in, in some way and, so that it could be used for a variety of different um, designs. And um, so we started essentially mapping people's um, um, equipment that they had available to them, where they were located, what capabilities they had, what capacities they had. Um, we started to plug in, you know, private companies as well. And, um, and, and so we were building this network where the idea was we could plug in uh, concepts from, from the early stages and, and have a variety of, of prototyping capabilities available to, um, to those projects. Um, a lot of them, like I said, had now been focused on, you know, PPE or other um, uh, COVID-related um, efforts. Um, but in, in a nutshell, um, that's what uh, what we were mapping out. And I, I. <laughs> was able to join our loop I, um, and I have no skills really in engineering. So I joined the social media team and that just required me retweeting everything. So thank you, Brent, for letting me join and then contributing my skill set. No, of course, that's what it's all about. And that's what's really interesting. You pulling everybody here together today. Um, you know, I think we all have similar mindsets and, and philosophies about creating a better world through transportation technology or technology in general. And I think it's really important to bring people together like this and, and to have these conversations. Um, so thank you a lot for, for arranging that and for everybody who's participating. Brett, I have a question about our loop. Are you guys a platform for different hyperloop ideas? I mean, are you, is that, can you have multiple different hyperloops being developed at our loop at the same time or? The idea was to mitigate the uh, cost and risk of early stage hardware projects generally. Um, so typically like we were talking about, it's hard to get money for them. They're long, super long development times. Um, so we were trying to figure out ways that we could mitigate those allow these projects to be developed, you know, whether they're five, seven, 10 years out from being realized. Um, but stuff that's well, really I, a marathon more than, more than sprints, right? Um, yeah, well, I'm just trying to sustain us through that. We have a Hyperloop project. Um, we have the IP and the work product from Arivo, 
which is a kind of Hyperloop light system. Um, they, they, got, they got rid of the tubes, though. They, they're just a car on a sled. In the middle uh, of the highway, right? Um, in, in a, well, they in were a way. they were doing tubes, and then they got it's rid of the tubes. And it's hyperloop architecture business. with no with no tubes. I just posted it's, a link. It's called it's more, more um it, It's more it's more intracity travel than intercity travel. Was their focus? Okay. No, I'm just interested because you know. ET3 has a wealth of knowledge, and they, if they had a platform that were able to scale up and get more input, it's, you know, it's, they quote, you should look at the patents for ET3 and uh, try I've to- I've a little bit with Daryl. Okay. What, uh, what? Not, not in any um, kind of collaborative capacity, but- uh, Yeah. Daryl's Dar uh, his own problem. <laughs> Yeah. And I, I, I really for glad. his personality, we have this by now. Go on. <laughs> I'm really glad um, Brent and Arlo, you know, was able to get the IP from Arivo. That was a really, a really nice. Um, well, we had a we had a good events. relationship. Yeah. We had a good relationship with Brogan, and also mm -hmm. some of the early Arivo employees were Arloopers. Oh, okay. um, nice. yeah. So it. We, we were always kind of close to what was going on there and, and vice versa. Uh, we had Broken come and for when we were testing our pods and um, he actually signed our, our prototype. <laughs> oh, cool. We got him to autograph the prototype. But um, um, yeah, it, it is a, a type of platform, Nick. It's really what we were building. We built a single person flight vehicle as well, which we tested in February at Moffett Field in, in California. Uh, and we were lucky that our international members were able to fly home after that because the, the kind of lockdowns and everything happened very shortly after that was tested. So, so if someone has ideas and they want to, them to be developed and they need to get patents, you guys work with, with, with uh, inventors as well that will have innovation? Yeah, that's that's the plan, and we are um, in, hopefully in the next few weeks, if not the next few months, um, going to be unveiling this um, platform that we've been working with a few, um, a few good, good companies um, to develop. And then, and then you manage more, this. The it's, it's more about sourcing the talent um, and, and the resources in terms of you know, the tools that are required to develop this. So it's and then what, you, you track the hours that all the engineers put into it. And say if I came with you, came with a, came to you with an idea, maybe we continue this conversation online. Yeah, but I'm sure. looking for a way to kind of crowd, crowdsource the idea instead of hiring the typical, you know, engineering firm um, because I don't want to hire the typical engineering firm, but yeah. Yeah, it's more I'm it's more based to... on deliverables than hours put in, but yes, that's essentially the the model. Okay. Cool. Has, has anybody that hasn't spoken today want to say anything about anything? <laughs> well, this has been fun. I don't know if we're about to end it, but yeah, it's great to meet people oh, no. that are concerned and into this stuff and know that we're not alone and we're not crazy. <laughs> That's what I feel like sometimes. I wouldn't go that far, but I, I now have a <laughs> Zoom Pro account. So, I mean, if this has been helpful, I do like the meeting format. I've been doing like very one directional YouTubes. Um, I like the meetings and nobody else is doing this. Uh, so if you want to continue doing this, um, I'm happy to set up another meeting next month um, and just, you know, very, very open. Um, this uh, has been recorded, uh, this video. If you don't want to be recorded, just tell me. <laughs> but I was going to be posting this online um, as how, content. So sorry. How can we share contacts with each other? I'd like to see if we can't. Uh, I would. I agree. A little easier. I would uh, drop a note in the chat or can you guys direct message each other i have no idea yeah but once this ends it's hard to 
when you're chatting, you can change who you're messaging to individuals or to everyone. Well, I threw yeah. my I threw my email address in there. If anybody else wants to throw their email in, and I'll copy the list and and and. Um, but we we ought to have a, a an easy mechanism for ongoing engineering chatting that doesn't require. Uh, think of it like Twitter for engineers. Mm. Or for I, politics. I'm happy to do these meetings. Um, they're they're easier for me to do than a typical video, actually. Um, but I, I I'll leave um, anybody else that has any ideas for communication <laughs> to other people. Um, I think like conferences like recently um or if you've been to any like research conferences recently they've just been like um uh they've been having people like register before when they register before they put in their emails and then they kind of afterwards send the list um so i think you got everybody's emails right blake because you yes, had I to did. like get the the so you could possibly do that um just like ask them via email like hey is it okay to share this information and then just like keep it on the list um, okay. Since you already got them, yep. And unfortunately, yeah, I didn't ask people to. <laughs> they wanted to share and, and, and when you were talking about remote working and everything like that, we really ought to look at because we write a lot of software, and I have software, a lot of software tools. I will just give to everybody, but we really ought to write an engineering remote working platform software, uh, similar to GitHub, but where we can tie it to how we're actually thinking about an idea so you could throw in drawings, comments, all of this sort of thing, and then hack on each other remotely. Yeah, that's, that's what we've been working on in collaboration with 3DS. And um, I'd, I'd love to show you a, a demo uh, on that and get some feedback as well. Because I agree, that's, that's one of the things that I've been thinking about for the past three, four years. It's, we need something like that. Thank goodness, Brent, you've been working on it for three or four years. <laughs> Can't wait well, to I've see not, that. I've not personally been working on it. I don't <laughs> have that skill set. <laughs> <laughs> but I can direct the work. <laughs> You're so modest. <laughs> Our HTML skills are pretty legendary. But anyway, <laughs> I'm just making stuff up. Um, any, so I see uh, we have a, new, uh, two, a couple of new people that joined the webinar. Um, we're just kind of freely chatting right now. Do you, anybody else want to give an update about Hyperloop or how you guys been staying safe or, or something? I don't have much of um, anything, but if we end up wrapping it up, I just wanted okay. to say thanks for everyone coming together and thank you, Blake, for putting it together. I think since we have such a common goal, um, the ability to bring groups, as we've all suggested, just to raise the st status quo and when any of us get something rocking and rolling, I mean, then we can hire all the other people that are on this webinar. <laughs> but thanks for putting it together. It's really, I think it's insightful and we can, we can um, scratch each other's backs and help each other out, so. Yeah, I mean, I haven't done a YouTube video in over two months just because, and I've talked with Sam Marth about this. I got a little in a funk, I was like, everything's going to shit. I don't want to do a video. <laughs> so this has been extremely uplifting for myself as well. <laughs> Thank you for joining. Hi. Right. Thanks a lot, guys. Take Thank you. Having, like, okay. Thank you, guys. I guess we'll sign right. off. Yep. <laughs> if you want to stay along, right. Thanks, uh, you can and chat. I'll just be here. But um. <laughs> Anybody else? No. Okay. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Cormac. Um, and uh, for the people that joined uh, new, definitely check out uh, Samara's post and link. Um, it got kind of buried in the chat. I'll just uh, <laughs> re-add it. Um, this is a uh, conference uh, symposium. Um, that's going to be virtual, and um, I I might have already messaged your teams if you guys are Hyperloop teams and stuff. Um, definitely sign up. Um, Samara, anything else? I, <laughs> I don't know. 
nah, man, you pretty much covered it. Um, yeah, just trying to like make sure that like uh, we really are building the research that can help towards that um, because I think everybody's like geographic. Uh, I think there's a there's a re reason for Hyperloop to be existing in every geographic region, um, and I think like uh, definitely it's really 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 cool to see um, Cormac and like Alberto um, on two sort of separate areas of the world talking about like that, and then people in the U.S. talking about their their need for it. So. I think before anything, just like making sure that the this is like peer reviewed, like proper research work is the for most, most important thing that really shows that it is so much more effective. And then once that is done, then it's really easy to just like, um, you know, get private companies involved, get mm -hmm. public private partnerships going or to just get full public funding, depending on, you know, where this is. Um, and that's what also since there's only like a few of us left, I would just. I actually was curious, um, Alberto, like about what you were talking about before, like with regards to Morocco. Um, are you like thinking of this? Um, have you reached out to the, the the people, the Spanish government about this, like for freight? Or are you, were you thinking about it being like something between Spain and Morocco? Because I know that one thing that's very interesting about, well, interesting and also like problematic, if you look at it another way, is the fact that like, um, Spain still has an enclave in Morocco, right? So they technically yes. could just like have a track between um, to, between like the southern end tip of Spain and like Queda, and then it would still be in the same country, right? So then you That's could get crazy. just that one government to fund it, but then it would be a problem getting it across like anywhere else. But at least like in terms of the overseas part, that seems like relatively simple, right? Yeah. We were thinking about it, but in the end, uh, the same uh, agreement between countries needs to be done. So in the end, the infrastructure, offshore infrastructure will be more expensive. So that's also the reason why we were thinking that maybe creating this collaboration between countries could be beneficial because uh, the money needed for that will be extra added to the onshore uh, infrastructure. But yeah, we haven't reached out the, the government yet. We are working on creating our own contacts there. Uh, and this is not something that we have to decide in the future. So this is more a political thing. But yeah, in the end, I think uh, the Hyperloop is not only understood as uh, economical and speed and so on, but also environmental issues. It's like sooner or later, all the governments I know mostly in Europe, uh, they are working on uh, green solutions because this is an initiative, the 2030 and 2050, that it, it needs to be done because if not, <laughs> we, we, we cannot live here. So I think uh, from this point of view, it's, it's very interesting uh, that we are developing Hyperloop. Also the, the cost that we would be saving in terms of emissions will, will be also a millionaire. So, I think uh, it's a, a also a good point to sell the, the the idea to the governments. I know now we have this economic crisis and so on, but uh, we have to understand that we have also this environmental crisis that it is easily for the people to forget about it, but it is as much important as, as the economic one. I agree. And it, I mean, <laughs> Um, the news in the United States has been a little rough for, for transportation policy. Um, so we are looking towards Europe, you know, and developing a lot of these systems and other countries and other economic regions because we know that we have a lot of issues here in the U.S. Um, so keep up the hard work. <laughs> yeah, we were thinking that in Europe they would be interested for this part also. We know uh, that in Morocco, they are eager to develop uh, new technologies that are Moroccan and African new technologies. For example, they constructed their first uh, high-speed railway uh, two years ago. It was the first, uh, first uh, highway, uh, high-speed railway in Africa. Mm -hmm. So they kind of, uh, the motivation of the people is to have this uh, high technology developed uh, on and in Africa, you know what I mean? So it's like this proud that the people have. So that's the reason why I, our idea in Morocco has been kind of successful. People is talking about it and they are passionate about it. 
So yeah, we are now extending it to Spain to get our contacts to, to try to in the future uh, build these relationships between countries because as I said before, I think Hyperloop is not uh, going to one city to another, but also going to one community to another. Just imagine, <laughs> I, I, I dream of, for example, being here, I'm living in Chicago and go there to my city. I go to Valencia or Madrid in two hours and it's crazy to me. So that's, that's the idea that is motivating us. So I think doing the, the route, the infrastructure on offshore in between Morocco and Spain would be beneficial because the, the, the route will be short and it can be a fresh and good start for this kind of constructions in the Hyperloop world. So that's why we are uh, working for that and to be the first initiative in, in this field and to foster other initiatives to in the end connect the whole world with the Hyperloop. That's, that's, uh, I can't have summed it up any better. Yeah, I, I just love the fact that this technology could just be so dramatically reduction of time in traveling. Um, it, it's just really impressive. Um, Ale, uh, thanks for uh, putting on Instagram uh, the uh, this uh, chat today about coronavirus. I'll, um, yeah, you guys have been doing a really good job uh, with social media as well. So keep it up. Um, anything else? Well, thank you very much, Blake. Thank you for uh, this webinar. And this is really nice to be here and nice to meet you all. So I will leave right now and have a good day. Yeah, have a good afternoon. I'm going to go have breakfast. <laughs> I'm starving. <laughs> Yeah, me too. <laughs> okay. okay. Bye bye. Right. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Thank you for your time and yeah, we are open to to this uh, open communication channel. So whatever idea you have, maybe creating a Slack channel or a Google group or whatever, we we are totally in to share our uh, knowledge and our vision and so on to progress all together. Cool. Yeah, I I'll definitely try to schedule another webinar. Um, I don't know about the Slack channel, uh, but yeah, I'll try to figure this out and I might have to bounce ideas off Smart. <laughs> so uh, thanks. Okay. But, um, so all right, we'll have a good afternoon. Thanks for your time for organizing yeah. this. No problem. Thanks for putting this together, Blake. Really. Nice to meet you yep. guys. Yep. Nice to meet you. It was awesome. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.